Thank you everyone for joining our Vera Last Suite intro. Uh, my name is Felix Vargas. I'm the Field Chief Technology Officer um, at VMware. Uh, just a little background on me. Um, I've been at uh, ClearPath um, for about a year. And uh, you know, previous to that, I was at VMware for about three and a half years. Uh, so uh, with uh, me coming on to ClearPath, part of my goal is to really focus on digital transformation and how that affects business and how we can help organizations um, plan out their digital transformation strategy. Uh, one of those topics of conversation that comes up a lot when we talk about digital transformation is operating like a public cloud for on-premises and, uh, and understanding what that means. So uh, that is uh, uh, the topic of today, which is the vRealize Suite, VMware's cloud management platform, uh, something that is near and dear in my heart because I spent a, you know, a good amount of time at VMware focused on this area specifically. Uh, I'm actually joined by Tom Zabo, a friend and an ex-colleague from my VMware days. And as a matter of fact, Tom, I think I was your uh, cloud management SE when you were a core SE at VMware, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and now you've- That sounds uh, great. Yeah, now you've mo moved up and, and Tom is a, you know, a phenomenal resource, one of my favorite VMware you know, employees, and he really knows his stuff. And uh, he's now a cloud management SE, but I'll let you do your intro. Uh, you know, go ahead, Tom. Sure. Thanks, Felix. Uh, good to see you. So, hi, everyone. My name is Tom Zabo. I'm a senior solutions engineer at VMware. Um, I've been at VMware for about five years now and have been floating around in the IT industry in one role or another longer than I care to admit. Uh, I'll just give everyone a fun fact. This is the first time in my life I've ever had a beard. So, thanks for joining, everyone. Right. Um... This is the first time in my life where I've had a, a, an opportunity to grow a beard and I can't grow a full beard. So uh, there's that. <laughs> uh, that's great. No, thanks for joining. Uh, we've done um, a couple of webinars uh, and uh, these webinars are, you know, focused around cl uh, cloud management, automation, containerization, security, cl hybrid cloud. Uh, so there are a lot of topics that we like to, to cover. And, uh, you know, what, what we like to do is do, do a joint sort of uh, uh, de uh, presentation where you get my take, you get Tom's take. It's always good to get different perspectives on what we're seeing. And so that's uh, sort of the, the, uh, the idea of this, uh, of this particular presentation. I'll be doing some annotating. I hope it doesn't distract you, but uh, I, I like to emphasize a couple points. Uh, so, um, you know, I'll be doing some of that. But uh, the agenda. So from an agenda perspective, I'm actually going to um, kick off a poll right now. Um, for you guys to chime in and, and talk and, and give your, uh, your vote on what you would like to see next from a webinar perspective. I threw some ideas out there. If you have any that aren't there that you'd like to see, please submit those to the chat. We will be moderating the chat and the Q&A uh, for, for questions. So, uh, you know, send those over to us. Uh, but just to go over them, you know, what would you like to hear next? The why, the how, and the what of digital transformation. That's a topic that gets thrown around a lot. What does that mean to us? You know, how are we helping customers as it, as it relates to digital transformation? Um, also application modernization in Kubernetes operations is, is, is faced with, uh, you know, with being able to uh, uh, enable developers as it relates to application modernization. So, so we can talk about that and, and, and what we're doing to help customers there. Also a map, uh, advanced automation concepts. We will be talking about automation today. It won't be a deep dive into automation. It will be an introduction into the uh, uh, VMware's cloud management platform, the vRealize Suite. Uh, however, if you wanna see any, anything from an advanced perspective uh, on, on the automation side of the house, you know, that, that, you know, you certainly vote for that. And uh, hybrid cloud always comes up. So hybrid cloud strategies, use cases. I was just on a call with a financial institution where they wanted to migrate to the private cloud and they want to, you know, from a disaster recovery perspective, right? So we had an interesting discussion there. So we can share some of that knowledge with you that we're, that we're learning when we talk to customers. And also uh, another option would be comprehensive data center security. So if you're interested in seeing any of these topics or impressed to, you know, cover these, um, you know, please uh, let us know. I've launched the, um, the poll now so you can uh, vote. Keep in mind that you can vote for all of these uh, if you want to you know, hear about all of them, or you can just pick one if you so choose. So you can certainly select multiple choices as it relates to the poll. So I'll, I'll have that going in, in the back end. So please take an opportunity to vote. I'm seeing a lot of folks uh, that are, are voting already. Um, and uh, it looks like uh, hybrid cloud is leading, by the way. So, <laughs> uh, which is not surprising, but yeah, keep voting. Uh, we'd love some, some feedback. And again, if, it's, if uh, there isn't anything um, 
if, if you're, the option that you want to hear about is not there, uh, please send it to us and we will consider that. Again, we already have a couple planned sessions on May uh, uh, 20th. We have a VCF deep dive and we also have done sessions on um, the uh, intro to VCF and also networking and security. So those are all, you know, already ones that we have done. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's talk about the agenda. So uh, Be Realize Suite, the Be Realize Suite story, we're going to start there. We're just going to, you know, give you some background on the platform uh, and some of the challenges that it, it is uh, uh, set to solve, right? So we'll cover cloud management, automation, hybrid cloud. Uh, we'll sprinkle in some VCF there, although we covered that topic a bit already. We're also going to go into a demo. And this is a very interesting demo um, uh, that uh, Tom Zabel is going to be leading. Uh, and we're going to take the demo uh, from different perspectives. One is going to be the developer perspective and what their experience is and how they can request resources from IT. And then we'll also talk about um, the uh, operations persona or the virtualization admin and their process for maybe putting this stuff together as far as a portal or monitoring and, tr and troubleshooting uh, your, uh, your cloud. Uh, so, and then we'll cover key takeaways and then we have a call to action. There are a couple of things that we want you to, you know, sort of take away as far as action items around uh, optimization assessments and digital transformation workshop shops that I run and, and ClearPath provides. Uh, and also, uh, you realize uh, uh, automation basic POC, things that you can sort of do that don't involve a lot of time that can sort of uh, uh, get you going as it relates to cloud management. These are all geared towards a cloud management sort of audience or the private cloud. So again, yes, we are recording. I saw something come in through the chat. So this is being recorded. We will share this recording uh, with the folks so you guys have, you know, can consume this at a later date or, or send it out to your teams. Also keep in mind that, you know, we love this format from a webinar perspective, but we can also have more personalized meetings around your needs and, you know, and things that are, are specific to you. So this is more of a, an intro, but we can, we can go really deep here uh, as we see fit and, and, and as, your, as your interest uh, uh, dictate. So uh, keep that in mind. So we will be sharing the recording. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. So one of the things, you know, from my perspective that I see is that applications are king. Um, the way that users consume applications, the way that they're using applications, and the overall user experience is central to everything that uh, it, it surrounds digital transformation. I think that that is the foundational component of digital transformation is as a business, uh, rethinking how we're servicing our customers and redesigning their experience. And uh, in today's day and age, that has a lot to do with technology and applications and infrastructure and automation, right? And so uh, that's why this is all important. And, you know, one thing to consider is, you know, what applications are going through in the data center, right? And what is the life cycle of the applications and where is that journey taking us? And uh, one of the things that we always look at uh, is existing applications versus cloud native applications. What exactly does that mean? And um, how are uh, customers addressing this, right? And what are the options as far as applications are concerned out there? So I'll go over these options and, um, and I'll, you know, we'll, we'll focus on, on, on each one of these options, what they mean to me. You know, I'll go through them and then I'll, I'll pass it over to Tom and, and he'll chime in. We're, we're very, we, we don't have a lot of slides as it relates to actual content, but we have, we have a demo, but we, you know, what we're going to do is take, uh, you know, different perspectives on, on each slide and, and, and give you some insight as far as we see it. So from my perspective, um, you know, if we look at the application, uh, uh, applications and, and the change that they're going through, uh, the first one that we see is maintained. So a lot of organizations are looking to maintain the, their applications and maybe, maybe not change them. Right? So if you have existing applications that you're running um, and you, know, you, don't, you don't necessarily you know, want to sort of you know, change anything about the application or change the platform, keep it as is, um, you, you know, a lot of organizations are opting to do that with some of their applications. Right? Um, and what that means is if you're running a, an application on premises, um, you know, keeping it on premises and not necessarily going to the cloud is, is probably best for that application, depending on the application. Right? And so um, I always say that Assessing your application and, and understanding where they fall is, is the best strategy, right? What we're also seeing is a, a replatform of sorts. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, replatforming means you don't change the application itself, but you run, you change the platform that it's running on, right? So, for example, um, you could have Microsoft SQL running on premises, 
Um, and maybe you don't want to run that on premises anymore and you want to leverage Microsoft SQL and Azure, right? You're not necessarily changing the fact that it's Microsoft SQL or how you manage that application or, or what you do, but you're changing the infrastructure that it's running on, right? And there are very various reasons why you, why you would do that. Um, you know, from my perspective, I see a lot of uh, data center evacuation where, you know, I, I'm, I'm coming up on a big refresh and I don't no longer want to deal with it. So I want to leverage some sort of infrastructure as a service component or platform as a service component to where I don't have to you know, manage that application any longer. But that is, that is an option. Also, you have multi-tier or hybrid uh, where you shift portions of your applications to the cloud or to consume native resources in the cloud and others remain traditional. An example of this, um, you know, I had a customer that had a very large Oracle database on premises uh, and they wanted to start uh, picking away at that Oracle database. So one of the things that they did was it, they took the front end uh, web servers uh, of that application and they didn't want to change those. They wanted to keep those the same. However, the database, they wanted to tear it away and they were looking at RDS. And so one of the things that they did is uh, they leveraged a uh, technology called VMware Cloud and AWS to vMotion the front end servers and, and not change them, uh, but leverage RDS for the, for, for the Oracle piece, right? Instead of uh, leveraging the on-premises Oracle, they leveraged RDS. And so VMware Cloud and AWS allows customers to run distributed applications where some of them are traditional vSphere and some of them are you know, maybe leveraging some native AWS services. So very interesting there. And there are other examples of that, uh, but th those are a couple. Um, and so this is specific to existing applications and, um, and what we want to do. And, and a lot of the requirements around that, even if you have existing applications, this, this webinar is, you know, directed at you as well, because you still want to monitor, you still want to upkeep, you still want to make sure that you're providing security and control for those applications. So these are things that you're still going to want to do and you still want some sort of cloud management platform to, to, to give you those capabilities. The other side of the house is the cloud native applications. And this is a world that is trending and there's a lot of change there. And, and the way that I see you know, you know, this shaping out is for customers or organizations that have revenue producing app applications, that um, have competitors, you, you know, th there is a trend to modernize their, those applications and run on microservices. And the reason why, from my perspective, is user experience. If a user tells you, I want something to change within an application, and it takes you three months to do it, that user may go somewhere else, right? Because you didn't update it fast enough to uh, provide the value that they're looking for. So by leveraging or shifting from a not monolithic application approach to a microservices or distributed application approach, you can uh, update specific components of the application and you can be more granular in, in your process of releasing updates, right? And that ties into CICD, that ties into all of that. And, and that's what refactoring really is, is you're taking a traditional application and you're refactoring it so that you can be more nimble and uh, meet customer needs uh, uh, as well, right? And or, or, or more quickly meet customer needs. So that's what refactor speaks of. It's not necessarily something that uh, where you know you're keeping the application the same, and one thing to consider also is when you're refactoring, you may only refactor a portion of the application that's running microservices. So uh, what I'm seeing also is that when you containerize, you may not containerize everything. You may still have a Microsoft SQL backend that you know that isn't necessarily containerized for your application. So keep that in mind. So um, I see some applications that certain parts of it are modernized, others aren't, and but the trend is to modernize all of it so that we can uh, iterate faster. And then we also um, have developed for cloud where these applications are um, either you know SaaS applications that are deployed on-prem but they're developed with the microservices approach from the get-go in the 12-factor uh, uh, approach right out of the gate right so it's something that it is designed as such you're not having to take a monolith and, and convert it you're actually thinking microservices from the design uh, to the in, to, to the implementation of that application so uh, these are sort of two different applications and then we're also seeing organizations replace um, applications as well, right? And a lot of what we're seeing there is SaaS. The biggest you know, example of that is Office 365, where customers go to Office 365, they had Exchange on premises, and they, re they, they remove a huge requirement around storage and maybe management, and now they're running, they're providing the same level of service, if not better, to their end users, and they're doing it in a SaaS way where the organization doesn't have to manage that, right? Uh, a lot of organizations that I talk to have a SaaS first uh, approach where 
they're looking at SaaS. If there isn't a good SaaS product out there to, to solve the problem that they're facing, then you know, they, they look at other options, right? Uh, and, and these options here, but primarily they want to consider SaaS first. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Tom. You know, what are your thoughts on, the, uh, on this progression? So I, I think you nailed it. You're seeing a lot of the same things that I am. And uh, the, the interesting thing, and you were talking about it when you were um, you know, around refactoring, the reality is for the majority of organizations that I, I speak with, and I think in general, is that um, it's for at least the, the near term, even if your goal is to go completely containerized, um, it, the fact is you're going to have to maintain um, all of this, or at least a fair portion of what you see on the screen, which is, um, you know, maybe easier said than done at times. So um, it, it's it's absolutely something to to look at and be very aware of when it comes to just road mapping and planning for the future right. and keeping things realistic, I think. Right. And, and what are you, from your perspective, Tom, as far as challenges around, you know, cloud adoption and, and moving these applications to the cloud, what are, what are some of the things that you're seeing with your customer base? Uh, so cost, cost is always front and center, um, you know, being concerned about going from, you know, hey, whether they have a good grasp of what their actual costs are from an on-prem perspective or not, um, you know, at this point, it, it's, everyone knows, you know, when, when you're leveraging the public cloud, you know, that meter is kicking. So if you have an idle workload sitting in your on-prem data center, maybe not the best use of resources and idle workload sitting up in AWS, a really not good use of resources and, and you're going to pay the price for it. So um, cost is a little bit of a hesitation and also just learning, having to learn a new platform, um, you know, hey, we're supporting all these different applications, keeping the lights on and now trying to pick up new technology and, and, you know, almost relearning um, some of the things that you've been doing for your career. I, I, I talk to a lot of people where their careers are actually just going in different directions. Um, you know, traditional infrastructure folks being more almost, almost quasi developers at times, you know, going that DevOps type of mindset. So um, those are some of the challenges that I'm seeing. Right. And, and also, I mean, I, I was talking to a customer recently and one of the things that they brought up was around, Hey, this is great. You know, I want to replatform. You know, and, and in their case, it was you know Microsoft SQL, and, and they wanted to run that in PaaS and Azure. Uh, and, and so the challenge that they had is that they're they're VMware administrators, right? So they're used to managing their environment from a VMware perspective. They understand the SQL side, and they and, and they you know they're they're well suited to manage the SQL platform and all of that. And and you know, but in, in that instance for them, you know, it's a little bit of a challenge to run that in a in a platform that you're not familiar with, right? And and you don't have the skill set in. Uh, and still being, uh, you know, required to look at security, reliability, and control, uh, and, and keep that. So a lot of what I'm seeing is once I get there, who's managing this? Do I have the internal skill set to do it? And if not, who can help me, right? Um, yep. And also, when we're talking about, you know, cloud migration specifically, um, doing an application rationalization so you can understand, hey, what are all of my applications, and which ones are good candidates to go to the public cloud, right? Uh, like, for example, Exchange is a dead giveaway, but there are others out there. But having a full understanding of those applications so you can determine what your near-term on-premises footprint is and what your long-term on-premises footprint is, is always, a, is always a challenge. Because oftentimes, you don't have a good understanding of what should go where. Is, is, is RDS great or should I be using Microsoft SQL? What is your experience? So there's a, there's a lot there. Um, so that's, that's great. Anything else you want to add here, Tom? I think that, that I think you nailed it. All right. Cool. Well, you know, we'll move on here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, cloud foundation and, and what that means and modernizing your data center. From my perspective, really what we're, from a, a VMware perspective, what's, what's happening is, if you think about the, that, uh, I'm going back to user experience and iterating an application and, 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 doing, and, and doing those tasks. Um, a lot in order to keep up with developers that want to modernize your, your, uh, their, uh, their applications, um, you know, internal IT has to evolve, right? And they, and they have to be able to provide services beyond what they're providing today. And uh, what we're often seeing is that because maybe the uh, on-premises, the operations teams aren't providing those resources in a timely manner to the developers, the developers lose confidence in operations and then they go to AWS, for example, to get a Kubernetes cluster per se. And, you know, Kubernetes is a, is a, is a platform for, you know, that orchestrates containers and it's, it, it ties into uh, the whole idea of application modernization, and it enables that really. 
Uh, and so what, what we're seeing is that our, our lack of um, you know, ability of operating like a, uh, uh, like a public cloud for on-premises or having that cloud operating model, model for on-premises is getting in the way of, of a lot of these initiatives, right? And so um, we're looking and we've done webinars before on this from a clear path perspective. So if you want to, uh, if you want to, uh, uh, you know, if you need a recording for those, let us know, we'll send it to you. But the concept of Cloud Foundation is operating, bringing that public cloud model for the on-premises data center where lifecycle management uh, is taken care of and you can focus on what the business needs, not necessarily, um, you know, uh, what firmware version you should be on, right? And so these are things that we want to sort of stop doing and focus more on, uh, on things that are more aligned to the business or activities that are more aligned to the business. So today, we're not going to focus on Cloud Foundation per se, but we will cover the uh, automation and operations piece of it, right? Because the vRealize suite actually uh, is part of the Cloud Foundation family. And we're going to double click on specifically that. In previous webinars, we have uh, talked about this holistically. Today, we're going to sort of double click on automation and operations and what that means. Um, Tom, anything to add here? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. I mean, the, the key pieces are just driving simplification through the entire stack um, and making it easier to you know, have pragmatic access to that nice underlying solid foundation, you know, foundational infrastructure that you've built. Um, so that way, you know, to going back to the point of the last slide, you can focus on the applications and what's actually driving the business because, um, you know, th there are some, some uh, outliers to this, but for the most part, you know, your business doesn't rely on whether you're running vSphere 6.5 or vSphere 6.7. It's the applications and the data that's sitting on top of that infrastructure that's important. So trying to just simplify that entire stack, introduce automation at different levels, um, and then have, you know, take that software defined policy approach that now we can wrap orchestration and automation on top of, which we're about to get into, is, is really key and a big piece of what we're, what we're driving with VCF. Perfect. So let's uh, let's you know talk a little bit more about specifically about what we're talking about here. So there, there are four main subject areas that we're gonna uh, we're gonna discuss. Uh, we've discussed hybrid cloud to to a to a, a large degree. So uh, we have a good understanding there. Uh, we've talked about virtual machine containers. We've talked about Kubernetes. Intrinsic security is an interesting concept and something that we've done a webinar on around making you know policy-based management of, of a security perspective across clouds, right? Being able to have a centralized policy from a security perspective across various clouds uh, is very important, right? As you shift to the uh, to the public cloud, uh, what I also hear is how am I doing security there, right? Uh, and and how am I providing a consistent infrastructure for my on-premises environments? Uh, so operational efficiency as we move up, that is a you know one key piece of uh, of operating uh, um, you know a. a, a, a private cloud and having the context and visibility to know, am I oversized? Am I undersized? Um, you know, do I need to uh, you know, remediate a particular workload? If, or if I have a service that's running inside of a VM, how can I automate my response to that critical service failing? Is there something that is observing that service that can give me, you know, a warning around what we're doing? And so there is a, there, there is a lot there. Also integrated compliance, you know, the vSphere hardening guys are, uh, guides are a great uh, tool and you can you know, point, for example, operations manager, which is one of the monitoring and, and troubleshooting tools at your environment to see where you're off, right? And where things may not be up to the vSphere hardening guide as well as PCI as well. So there's a lot that goes into when you start trying to fulfill that private cloud model, there's a lot that goes into cost optimization and capacity optimization. I need to be as efficient as possible with my resources. What context do I have to decrease the amount of resources that I have? Also, capacity planning you know, comes into that as well. Uh, how well am I able to answer questions around if I need to add a thousand VMs to my environment, what will it do to that environment and what sort of effect will it have and do I have enough capacity to meet that requirement? These are things that customers you know, that I talk to, some are doing this in a manual way and we want to sort of streamline that and provide consistent operations. And then also flexible comp uh, consumption. And I can't stress this enough from an operations perspective, ultimately we're you know, IT service delivery, right? We're providing ser services to internal and potentially external users. Some of those in internal users are 
leveraging the services that operations and IT is providing to um, provide a product or a service for our customers to consume. So IT is at the center of the business in, in, in reality. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very critical component for us to be able to provide self-service catalog for those users um, and, and provide automated provisioning and all these things that come with, uh, with uh, the IT service delivery framework as, as, as well as applications operations and understanding metrics and uh, pipelines and uh, container management. A lot of the next generation components and being able to deliver these modern applications um, you know, without having developers go to the public cloud. And if that's the strategy where the public cloud makes sense, and I, I don't want it to seem like the public cloud is the enemy, but the reality is that if that is the best tool for the job, by all means, but if we're only doing it because we can't meet the demands, and that is more of a challenge and something that we need to internalize and see how we can solve. So application delivery and observability are very important. What are some of the challenges that you're seeing uh, there, Tom, as, as, far as, as well as, uh, as far as IT service delivery? Uh, is that something that you know your customers are struggling with? Uh, I, I think the biggest thing is is you know needing to have good controls over around what they're doing. Um, you know, to, to your point, either understanding the capacity, what you actually have available to consume, and to wrap some guard, being able to wrap guardrails around it, um, because you know, hey you can create a power cli script or a powershell script that's going to automate a, a, a ton of different things you could do quite a bit there but that's not necessarily you know you wouldn't take that script and email it to every developer in your company and say hey when you need a resource run this script probably not a good idea um so that's a big piece of that i see people struggling with is just how to take it to the next level beyond what they're, you know, maybe what they're currently doing, you know, maybe, hey, hopefully you're, you're leveraging templates, um, but now put it, being able to put that in someone's hands where they can now consume that without having to, you know, enter a ticket, you know, the traditional model, you know, developer puts in a ticket um, into an ITSM or something along those lines, and two weeks later, maybe they get a virtual machine, then they never want to let up, you know, give that virtual machine up again. So we have, you know, a lot of wasted resources no lifecycle management, no reclamation of anything that's getting created because there's a lot of um, either fear of never being able to get the resources again or fear of reclaiming something that someone's actually using and you don't have the visibility into, hey, wh what is this person actually doing with, with this VM or this, this container or, or however you want to frame it? Right. And what I see often, that's a good point that you bring up. I also see like when we do the uh, optimization assessment, so I, I briefly touched on that at the beginning, but an optimization assessment is when we basically do a proof of concept of, of the cloud management platform as it relates to operations. And, and like, for example, the two blocks that you see here at the bottom. Um, and so when we do those assessments, one of the reports that we run are, you know, idle resource report, right? Uh, what VMs are out there that are not being used and how much are they consuming of the infrastructure and what is the dollar amount that is tied to that? So that's a quick report that you can run to determine you know, are the resources that I'm being, that, that I'm delivering, are they even being used anymore? And, and, and why aren't they giving it back? And to Tom's point, a lot of that is maybe I won't get this back if I, <laughs> if I wave my hand and say that I have it. But uh, one thing to note is keep in mind is if, you know, we keep how, you know, talking about the developer aspect of it, if you don't have developers in your environment, if you, do, you know, if that is not a need of yours, um, what you're focused on is the bottom two, right? Because even if you're not modernizing applications, even if you're just looking to uh, keep existing applications as is, you still need to be efficient. You still need consistent infrastructure and intrinsic security for your on-premises data centers. A lot of the uh, customers that I talk to have a lot of different platforms that they're managing. They might have a Pure Array, they might have a Nimble Array, they might have a Dell EMC Array, they might have you know, HP Blades or Dell Blades or Cisco, right? And so all of these technologies are increasingly difficult to manage because let's be real, we can't be an expert in everything, right? So standardization and having a consistent infrastructure are very important. And also, you know, operational efficiency and consistent operations. So just keep in mind, I, I, I don't want to sort of alienate the folks that don't have developers, but you know, that is a very trending topic right now. And a lot of organizations are struggling at meeting their demands. Excellent. So we'll go ahead and, and, and move on to, to the next topic here. We'll dive a little deeper into um, what the, um, you know, the V Realize Suite provides uh, as it relates to maturity. So we talked a little bit about the fact that if you don't have developers, you're looking at consistent operations and consistent infrastructure. So, you know, this is that line of deviation, right? And so, and, and this is tied to maturity, right? And so, 
you need this foundation, right? So we talked about cloud foundation and what that is, taking the cloud operating model and bringing it to on-premises. Uh, we talked. Uh, we haven't really talked about View Realize Network Insight, but that is a NetFlow tool that gives you application dependency mapping, who's talking to what via what ports, so that you can help plan disaster recovery, security, you name it. And then there's also the consistent operations aspect of it around View Realize Operations and Log, uh, log Insight. Uh, log Insight is looking at uh, log data, right? It's aggregating logs and allowing you, giving you the context from a log perspective so you can take action. Uh, and the Realize Operation is looking more at the structured uh, data, right? From vCenter, from the UCS platform, you know, maybe a, a server, a, a Dell's a platform, or, you know, VxRail, for example, or in all these components that are out there and giving you that visibility. So, so those two actually become that, uh, you know, consistent operations platform that touches a lot of the different components that you have in your data center and gives you one source of truth as to, as to what is going on and what pieces are not working. And a lot of the times what I see is that you might have a VM that is not performing well and you might think it's the VM, but when you start looking into that issue, the host maybe is oversubscribed and it's having some sort of memory issues. So uh, being able to click into the issue and understand what is the root cause, that's what these tools are, being, are helping you do, uh, not only from a logging perspective, but also from a structured data perspective and, and gathering this information. And, and, and if you have Splunk, that's great. Um, a lot of what I see as far as Splunk is that customers that have Splunk may not be gathering data uh, log data from their vSphere environment, right? And so what we're doing here is we're, we're giving you that capability at a fraction of the cost to, to gather the, the log data from a, a vSphere environment. Now for folks that have developers and, and, and need to function, you know, as a service delivery platform, uh, that's where vRealize Automation comes in. And, you know, the, these things, may, uh, these components make up the vRealize suite. And then that's where you can have that, that catalog or that, you know, service broker where a developer has a self-service portal uh, brokered by IT for them to consume their resources. If that's a Windows VM, great. They, they go to the, to, uh, to the catalog, they execute uh, the creation of a Windows VM, for example. And more importantly, in, in something that is often missed is after that is automated and deployed, what does day two look like? If I want to then edit that VM, run a script on it, if I want to increase capacity, if I want to restart it, if I want to console into it, we have a challenge around being able to provide developers that level of, of access, right? And so oftentimes day one and just the stand up is a ticket that I've seen take a month in some organizations, upwards of three months, depending on what you know change control processes you have. Uh, and then that day two aspect to say, hey, I wanna change this VM and up the memory and RAM, that also can take up to seven days because that's also a ticket that has to come in. And then while the developer's waiting for these resources, they're getting impatient and they might be going to, to, to the cloud, right? Which, which is, if that is not what we have uh, from a design perspective and, and if we don't have those options for them, it, it, it can be troublesome. And then also, Real uh, gathering real time uh, data. So Wavefront is a real time analytics platform that does time series and uh, it pumps uh, data real time into a platform that allows you to create dashboards. Th this particular product is interesting because you know, I've seen organizations where the developers own a piece of the application, the operations guys owns a piece of the applications and the DBAs might own a piece of it. And then if, when something goes wrong, if there is a, some sort of issue that is happening within the application, a user says, hey, something isn't working, then everyone's sort of uh, you know, pointing the finger or show, showcasing their own dashboard that they have of their internal tool. And you know, I call that the fog, fog of war. We're, we're not sure what's going on or, 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 or what to believe. And so uh, what, where I've seen Wavefront uh, you know, function is being that single source of truth that developers can access, the operations teams can access, and also the DBAs, for example, around application monitoring and being able to have real-time metrics to determine what's going on and where the issues are. So as you progress from the infrastructure foundation to self-driving operations, to the IT service delivery and application operations, uh, the View Realize Suite has you covered. Um, Tom, what are, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing, um, you know, specific to, um, you know, a, a application monitoring, you know, at, at that layer, you know, is, is there, how are customers handling that today? And, and I know there are some components to View Realize Operations that provides application monitoring. How does that differ from what Wavefront provides? Uh, good, good question. The, the biggest thing that I see is um, different perspectives from a you know when you're monitoring an environment or a specific application. Uh, whether you're looking at it from you know the vSphere perspective, you know which has always been anyone that's that's uh, been a, a, a vSphere admin for any length of time, you know 
you know, your vSphere hosts see a particular scenario, the operating system sees a particular scenario, then maybe your, you know, the application owner sees things differently. You know, SQL is a great example. When you fire it up, it wants to take every bit of RAM, um, you know, that, that it possibly can. But meanwhile, the vSphere host is saying, what, you know, why is it doing this? Um, so being able to complete the picture in a way where, uh, you know, different roles or folks can see what, you know, the, get the intelligence that they need, but complete that picture and bring it together where, so that everyone understands and are on the same page from a, just maintaining something to, you know, hey, if something goes wrong, being able to dig in and troubleshoot, being able to understand it from, you know, from the, the top of the stack down and from the bottom of the stack up is probably, uh, you know, one of the bigger challenges that I see out there. Awesome. Which That's is exactly great. what we're bringing to the table here. That's great insight. Excellent. So moving right along. So if, if we if we look at this journey, right, and, and uh, the concept of, you know, covering the, you know, the entire spectrum from an operations perspective, the first step is set up, right? Uh, setting up your environment, you know, having those, um, you know, the cloud platform or APIs or, you know, as I call it, you know, that virtual infrastructure supplier, so to speak, you know, is that first step in the process. The second step is deployment, being able to provision, orchestrate, uh, you know, uh, you know, infrastructure and applications, and then it's monitor, right, uh, and, and manage and being able to monitor their environment, troubleshoot it and, and understand, have visibility into the different networking components. And then it's run, right, running the applications and have the observability to, to know when something goes wrong, to Tom's point, there aren't a lot of different perspectives that are being considered, there's just one, and that is what the customer is seeing and the metrics that support that experience, right? Um, you know, anything to add here, Tom? No, I think, I think you got it. Excellent. So moving right along then, let, let's jump into the demo. So for this demo, um, Tom, why don't you speak to this uh, since, you know, this is something you're going to be speaking to and, uh, you know, I'm very interested and in, in, in I'm looking forward to it. So go ahead and, and touch on what we're going to discuss. Sure. So we're going to jump in. Um, I'm going to take you through a couple of different scenarios. So one, we're going to look from a, a developer persona where, hey, I, I want to consume some resources to jump into a self-service catalog, request the resources, and, and see what it actually looks like from that point of view. To Felix's point earlier, um, you know, we're, we're calling out the developer, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a developer. I mean, when it comes to just deploying infrastructure in general, um, consistency, repeatability, being able to do it quickly um, is kind of key. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a developer, but just using that as the kind of frame of reference. Then we're going to take a look at um, what's behind the scenes, what's actually, um, you know, just take a quick look at a blueprint. We don't have a lot of time to get into infrastructure as code today, just to see what the view is from the, the back end of that self-service portal, if you will. And then we're going to jump in and, you know, speaking to that, that monitoring scenario that we were just talking about, being able to look at a way where, you know, now we can understand the, that application that was just deployed, the different objects that make it up and how you can dig in and, and really, you know, get a good view of everything that's going on. Excellent. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. So uh, go ahead and I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen, Tom, and then you can, uh, you can share, share yours. Give me a second. Yep. And hopefully I haven't timed out of anything. All right. There you go, sir. Cool. And just, you know, well, okay, there it is. Perfect. Um, go ahead. All right, great. Okay, so um, what, what, you see, what you should see on my screen right now is uh, what we consider uh, our service broker, which is our self-service catalog. So again, I'm, I'm logged in as, as myself, you know, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a developer at the moment. What do I care about? I like to have access to, um, you know, quick access to environments that I could spin up, spin down, um, you know, break things, test this, different things out. Maybe I want to either do some load generation. Maybe I want to, you know, introduce a new code. But the reality is I want um, as whatever resources or environments I can get my hands on. And while I might not care about security that much, um, I, I also know that I don't want to get smacked from uh, any corporate security, you know, regulatory compliance uh, issues that might come up. So um, what you see here is a catalog of items. So this particular catalog is focused on um, an actual um, our uh, open cart application. So it's an actual website. So our retail store. So it's just a mock-up of a, of a company. 
So if I, you know, I log in, here's my catalog that I've been presented with different services that I can consume. So today, you know, maybe I just want to deploy a, a model of that, you know, of our retail um, site. So I'm going to come in and click request. Right. And, and one thing is, as we look at this, that catalog could have vanilla Windows VMs. That catalog could have Microsoft SQL. It could have Linux. It could even automate some active director, uh, directory processes and, and things of that nature. So it's pretty much anything that, you know, it may be required, right, uh, from an automation perspective can be there. Yes, absolutely. And you could very specifically control the, the different types of environments and components that are that are available. So in this particular catalog, it's all focused around our our retail shopping cart. So um, just to walk through like a quick idea of what this would look like. So if I want to provision some resources, if I could type, I'll just throw something in there. So now we have a bunch of different choices that we're going to walk through from our request. So instead of manually creating a ticket that has different information in or, or maybe is missing information, everything is being presented on this screen. So we have the concept of projects, which just basically associates users with different resources they can consume. We're going to leave that alone. Um, we, can, we have the concept of, of sizing or, or um, you know, flavors. So in this case, we could choose the node size that we want to actually deploy. So what this is going to deploy, it's, it's going to deploy a three-tier application with a software-defined load balancer. So you know, for different scenarios, you might want to have different sizes. If I just want to test a quick change to some code on the back end, maybe a small node deployment is going to be sufficient. But if I want to do a, a load test, you know, you actually generate load on my, my environment, maybe I want to start looking to see what the upcoming holiday season is going to Going to, going to affect my, my shopping cart, uh, maybe I want to deploy a larger environment and, you know, really crank up my testing. Um, so, you know, just choose what you want from a node size perspective, you know, different operating systems. If I, if I have a choice, you could see we're ingesting, you know, we can set up a username and password so we can actually log in and get access to the environment once it's deployed. Um, same thing from a front end, you know, how many, how many front end web servers do we want to de deploy? And this can all be, this is all set up on the back end where maybe small equals two, medium equals four, large equals six. It's all logic that you can have set up ahead of time. Um, the other thing that you could see here is we can actually deploy to different environments. So uh, we're going to deploy to vSphere today, but we can just as easily deploy to AWS, Azure, GCP, um, there's many different endpoints that we support. It doesn't just have to be vSphere. The other thing that we can do, and I'm gonna, I should have actually picked this off, is I can, based on my selections here, what I've selected, I can get a daily price estimate. I can reach out um, to that operations tier to understand what the costing will be associated with this deployment. So, you know, for example, if, if I'm going to deploy, if I know I'm gonna deploy 100 nodes, it might be a good idea for me to know how much it's going to cost me or my department or, you know, however we're logically divided as a, as a company. Um, in this case, I think I can afford, I hope I can afford $2.28 for today. So I'm going to go ahead and click submit. Excellent. And once this kicks off, you can see it just drops me to a, a deployment screen. Um, at this point, if there's some governance here, maybe somebody needs to approve my deployment. Um, you know, the workflow would, would kick off and, and send a, an, an approval request to, uh, you know, whether it's an admin, a manager, or whoever you want to actually have set up, again, from a controls perspective. In this case, I have no approval policy, so it's going to go ahead and start creating. Um, I have no desire to make you all watch a Blueprint deploy, uh, but you could see it's actually already, already moving through and, and going through its task. So I'm going to show you what it looks like when it's already deployed. So in this particular case, if you remember, the catalog was all around our, our shopping cart, our website. So I'm deploying a, a test environment right now. We have an existing production shopping cart that's available. This is tied to the, you know, to an actual website. So you can see, I don't want to call it, go. And we'll see, and this is just a little, robotics mock-up um, company and website that we have here for our, our lab environment. And you can already start to see we're, we're getting some good information around what the deployment actually looks like. So the name, you know, who originally created it, what project it was tied to, the different, um, you know, VMs that make it up and IP addresses. When was it created? Do I have a lease associated with it? If we click into the deployment, 
Now what we're going to see is, is a nice topology, a nice visual representation of the different components that make up the, the actual application itself. So we're looking at an application here. So, you know, the, the MySQL backend, we can click on an individual component and scroll through and quickly get, you know, some good information to, you know, hey, do I need to SSH into something? Do I want to know where it's running? You know, this is the, the region where it's deployed. And we can go through and quickly get some good information around, you know, IP addressing, you know, storage, you know, if there's anything in particular that we're doing from a, a you know, custom properties perspective or anything that we're doing, we have all of that intel right at our fingertips, really easy to start to see. Excellent. Hey, it's a question. It, but, so how do you, yeah. um, so once this is deployed, I think this is great. And, you know, how, how would a um, you know a, a you know a developer or someone that is you know uh, you know managing this application or developing the application how would they do have access to day two beyond the initial deployment? Like yep, if they want to you know, make a change or you know you know you know change the size of the cluster or or something of that nature. I don't know if you could if you could touch on that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So, so that that's. Um... So if we just go back here for a second, you'll see, and I'm not going to have any actions available in this, in this particular environment, um, but normally I would have different lifecycle actions that are available to run against either the, the deployment itself or yeah. the individual components that make it up. Understood. And if you look, yep, and these are actually some examples right here. If we look, we could see when it was initially created, who created it, and we could look through the actual events around the deployment. And then we could see, speaking to that, that day two action, at some point, um, someone else on my team came in and actually resized the MySQL component. And you can see they added two additional CPUs and two gigs of, uh, of memory here. Right. So that, that, that's a key point is to be able to, to, to deploy, but then also take action on your deployments um, going forward. So cool. this, is, this, is the, the actual product, this is the actual website. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we're, uh, we're controlling what actions you can take. 100%. And it's nice to be able to get that granular where you can control what people can do. Excellent. And so what does the operation side looks like then? So, what, once the, so I, can, I have a catalog that is authored by IT. They can, you know, the developers can access that catalog. I can do day two actions. I have access to costing. There's some monitoring components that are here. This is great. So from an operations perspective, what is deployed? Once this is deployed, what do I have, you know, for, you know, that, uh, for me to leverage and, and, and track the, uh, the uh, performance of these or capacity of these entities that have been deployed within the vSphere environment? Yep. Okay. So um, th there is some of that that we actually present right inside of the the interface itself uh, okay. and we can get in for example and start to look at you know cpu utilization and say hmm, that's interesting why are we getting these these spikes here um right. so this is all coming from that operations tier you know if you realize operations specifically so we're gonna we'll just jump over to that for a second to give you a right. you know a quick look at what that looks on the back end for more of a uh, an admin perspective, if you will. So if you've never seen VROPS before, here it is. So what we can actually do is, is we can search for the, that particular application, that deployment. So if I come here now from a, an admin perspective, now I've got a summary of, of the application, but more importantly, now I could start to look and real quickly see the different components that make up that application. So what we were talking about earlier about being able to complete that picture, and you know, hey, maybe the developer you know says, hey, our, my uh, my my Moad production shopping cart is slow. But what are the you know? It, it's not necessarily always that easy to associate an application with the underlying components. So that's what we're doing on the fly here. And then if we dig a little deeper, I know we're not going to have too much time to get get into this. You know, here's the actual deployment. You know, here are the virtual machines that were that make up that deployment. And now we can start to, to drill in and get focused where we need to, to understand, okay, so this is the, the particular VM that's, that's running here, you know, what services are running on it. So here's my MySQL database. Maybe I wanna go up the stack, all right? So here's the host that it's running on. You know, oh, it, it, it's also in my PCI environment. Maybe I should make sure that I, I'm, I'm following along from a regulatory perspective, like you were mentioning earlier about having that, um, you know, compliance reporting and things of that nature. 
So being able to just complete the picture and understand, all right, hey, it's, you know, what, what virtual distributed switch am I on? Um, and being able to drill in wherever we need to go um, to start looking and understanding why we're having pro- you know, why we're potentially having a problem, or at least being able to complete the picture and seeing everything together. That's excellent. And, and, you know, I think that this is very powerful because when we talk about being able to, uh, you know, affect mean time to resolution from the time we know something is wrong that has been reported to us uh, to the time that we can resolve it, having a full picture of all the uh, interdependencies so that, it, you know, with uh, color coded is very useful in, in decreasing that mean time to resolution. So this is phenomenal. Yep. And, um, you know, just taking it one step further real quickly here, mm-hmm. we can also pull in, you know, that, that logging, you know, so that you realize log insight, the unstructured components. So here, um, you know, we're, we're collecting logs from everything under the sun in, inside of the infrastructure, the, the vSphere host and vCenter on its own. Um, but in this particular case, going to logs, now I can look at logs that are associated with the particular object that I'm focused on. Um, and start to, you know, because logs are great, you can dig in and find out a, a wealth of information, uh, but it also can be like trying to find a needle in a haystack at times. So make it easier to just quickly, you know, if you need to get under the covers and dig in, let's, let's put focus on what we're actually looking at. And again, you know, focusing from the application perspective and then being able to dig into the individual components. Excellent. I love it. Um, you know, so let's, um, let's transition, um, you know, to, uh, you know, t- key takeaways in the Q&A. Uh, this is a phenomenal demo. And, and uh, again, in review, we're, uh, we discussed a developer persona, being able to provision uh, resources on, uh, uh, you know, via a catalog. Uh, we discussed a two actions, monitoring within the automation platform, and then that operations persona and being able to look at the overall health of the application, the key uh, 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 KPIs like you're seeing here, monitoring, troubleshooting, so a lot of great stuff. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and transition. Any any, uh, any parting words? Great job on the demo, by the way. I love the, the workflow. Any parting words as it relates to the demo, Tom? No, I mean just just like you said, ha- you know, a- anytime. Happy to go a lot deeper here. We're just just scratching the surface as far as the the, the capabilities. Excellent. Alrighty, so uh, transitioning, we're going to uh, close up and opening them up, open this up for, for questions here. Uh, so a couple things, right? So um, we went over the demo. Um, key takeaways, you know, the private cloud it, uh, vision is possible. So don't think that it isn't for you. If you want to operate like a uh, uh, like a, a private cloud, we, you know, we have those options here. These are some of the, the, the foundational components of achieving that. Uh, capacity planning and costing does not have to be difficult. So these tools are designed to help you with that. Configuration drift is a real challenge. Uh, we go to a lot of organizations that are running different versions of ESXi, you know, and you know that aren't necessarily matched. Maybe they're not up on uh, 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 on uh, uh, as far as uh, regulatory compliance, and, and you know, having that visibility is important. And then you know, IT is being asked now to move at the speed of the business, and and, and these tools help us meet that speed from an IT perspective and operations perspective. Um, and also call the action, right? So. If you want to try these tools, vRealize Operation, uh, vRealize Optimization Assessment is a is a tool that I can run for you from a partner perspective at ClearPath. Uh, like I said, I, sp- I spent many years at, at VMware doing demos like these, and you know it's it great to see uh, Tom run through it. So I can deploy the tool in your environment. We can. It takes about one to two hours to deploy, maybe less, right? Um, you know, it, it, you know, the, depending on you know the, the prereqs, uh, whether they're met ahead of time, and we can focus that that optimization assessment on monitoring and troubleshooting, capacity planning, and out of the box infrastructure reports, like what VMs are idle. Am I, you know, do I meet the infra, uh, the vSphere infrastructure, uh, the, the vSphere hardening guide, and uh, you know, how am I doing from a capacity planning perspective? So a lot of things that we can do there as far as running scenarios around adding VMs. So I definitely recommend that that is a free tool. You can run for 30 days in your environment and provides a lot of value. We also have digital transformation workshop uh, workshops at ClearPath where there's a two hour discovery virtual workshop. Uh, we've adapted our workshops to run virtually now where we discuss um, cloud management, automation, networking and security, hybrid cloud, application modernization. And uh, we really spend some time understanding where you are as, as it relates to your maturity and where you want to go. And then we'll sort of help you get there, right? So uh, a lot of positive feedback as it relates to these workshops. So reach out if, if, if you're interested. 
Um, we do an out, one hour playback with the short term and long term goal, uh, goals as well. And then a V-Realize basic automation POC. Uh, and it's something that we can do in a couple of two to three hours. And we do, you know, deploy this and provide a couple of blueprints for you. And then, uh, you know, we, we allow you to test the platform, right? So these are uh, three call to action uh, components. So reach out if you're interested in, 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 uh, in uh, um, it, it, um, investigating any of these and we'll be, we'll be glad to help you. So contact info for Tom and myself are, are up. Uh, you know, I understand we have cell phones. Feel free to call me, text me, email. You know, it, it doesn't matter. You can, you know, at me on Twitter as well. And I'm more than happy to discuss. I do keep my own blog as well, which is up there. Uh, so reach out. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and open it, uh, open it up for Q&A. So anyone out there uh, have a question that wasn't already addressed or uh, comment, concerned, uh, you know, now is your time to share. So you can send them via the chat. We do have uh, um, a couple that came in. One in particular is around Ansible. So what if I'm using Ansible for configuration management? Can vRealize integrate? Um, and so it, it, a little bit on Ansible open source and all that. Tom, do you wanna you know, uh, tackle that one? How, how does Ansible integrate to vRealize automation? Yep, um, so we actually integrate with uh, Ansible open source and Ansible Tower. So, you know, what, what, I, what I typically find is, is you know, maybe a, um, an organization started to use Ansible to do maybe a, an application deployment, something along those lines. So we, we can actually uh, tie it into vRealize Automation and present Ansible playbooks right alongside of our blueprints. So going back to the demo, when we did the blueprint, we would stand up the infrastructure, you know, do an IP, you know, grab an IP address, do everything that it needs to do and then reach out to Ansible and call a playbook to have it, um, you know, register that deployment and, you know, do any of those, uh, you know, uh, run the playbook to actually configure whether it's an application or the, the server itself. So we can definitely tie it in. Right. And from my perspective, I see a lot of organizations that start with Ansible open source and have done a considerable amount of work as far as expediting uh, deployment of applications. And they don't have to rewrite those playbooks. Uh, those playbooks are, you know, integrate well and you can leverage them within VRA. So uh, great question. Another one here uh, around ServiceNow. We have ServiceNow today. Can, uh, can VRA integrate? A hundred percent. VRA has integration points into uh, uh, ServiceNow where ServiceNow can serve as that portal. And then VRA can uh, be the engine uh, uh, be behind the scenes that makes everything happen as it relates to, uh, you know, bringing whatever automation task uh, uh, to reality. Um, and uh, uh, one other question around approvals and, and, and governance, what sort of approvals uh, are available and what policies can you institute as far as leases are concerned and, 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 and approval policies? Uh, Tom, you want to tackle that one? Yep. Yep. So we, we saw a little bit of that in the demo. Um, you know, when I initially requested something that you can, you can have approvals that say, all right, based on a particular criteria, kick it off. Um, you saw, I actually had no day two actions available to me on that production website. So that those were restricted rather than being able to reboot or resize something. My user account was restricted from doing anything on it. And then leases are the easiest way, especially from a, a play If you have a, a dev test environment, to introduce lifecycle management and get away from something is created and it never goes away. If it's not, you know, you probably wouldn't want to put a lease on your production website, um, but if it's just a dev test environment, why not? Why not just let it clean up after itself and reclaim those resources to be re reused someplace else? Excellent. Um, very good questions. Um, any others out there? So if you have any last minute questions, please submit them. Um, Otherwise, uh, you know, we're running a couple minutes over, um, but otherwise we'll, uh, we can address those questions. So if you have questions that, you know, you think about later and something that you haven't posted or you're, you're getting ready to, uh, here's the contact information. So feel free to reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to address those concerns and, and help you out uh, as it relates to uh, uh, understanding where you are from a cloud management perspective, right? So um, I don't see any other questions coming in. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining. Tom, excellent job on the demo. I love that demo. We need to uh, geek out a little bit on that and uh, I need to deploy that in the lab. So I really appreciate uh, you joining. Thank you, Alexis, for setting this up and thanks everyone. We'll be in touch. And uh, you know, the, uh, we looked at the panel or actually the, um, the poll and the result of the poll, uh, the winner was the hybrid cloud strategies and use cases. So there, there seems to be a lot of interest there. And then the second was advanced automation concepts. Uh, so we'll look, to, um, we'll look to incorporate those into our webinar schedule. 
but thank you for participating in the polling. That's very helpful and for joining today. Um, we look forward to the next webinar. Thanks for joining everyone.